So today we are in the next installment of the Doctrines of Eternal Security. Again, if you're visiting with us, I don't want you to get comfortable with PowerPoint. So in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to keep encouraging you, bring your Bibles. But uh, for now, everything's on the screen for you. We've already dealt with a couple of aspects of the Doctrines of Eternal Security. We'll cover just a brief overview of those in a moment. But... Um, this becomes very important to us, especially to me, because of the way I was raised. And uh, that's no criticism of my parents or the church that I attended, but the church where I was raised, they did believe that you can indeed be born again and then forfeit or lose your salvation based on works. So if you disobey the Lord, you have a danger of actually ending your life in hell. And that's a big problem for me today, based on the fact that I believe that salvation is not of works. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But today, our topic doesn't relate as much to the idea that a person that is genuinely born again is eternally secure, but what may happen in the event that a person actually believes that and then they do not reverence the Lord. And that is the problem of willful sinning. And so that's becoming a bit of an issue in our world today, uh, theologically and practically. And so that's where we are today today. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll pick up right through these uh, couple things and see where the Lord leads us. Amen? Father, thank you for the blessing and privilege you've given to us to be here in this building today. Thank you for the privilege of Bible study. Lord, it is a joy for us to learn and to grow. And we recognize that today... In much of Christendom, there is a discount related to doctrine. We love to talk about you, and we like to see people come to faith, but when it comes to rightly dividing the word of truth, oftentimes there is a lack of popularity and lack of interest in relationship to the contending for the faith that has been delivered to us as saints. And so, Lord, we do intend to be non-divisive, but at the same time, we have strong desire to articulate doctrine, to study doctrine, and to know what your word teaches us so that we may properly handle your word and also give an answer to those that ask of us for the hope that lies within us. And so, Lord, lead us and guide us today in this next installment of these passages and this discussion as we move our way through in this Bible study today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have already dealt with the subject of affirmations. Many verses that affirm your salvation. You have been born again of incorruptible seed. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You have been guaranteed safe delivery. Jesus said, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish. I love that. That gives me great confidence, especially having been raised in an environment where I was always afraid that I might lose my salvation, that I could just inadvertently or accidentally do something that would cause God to be angry with me and therefore cast me into hell. Then we dealt with the subject of the problem verses, many verses in the Bible do seem to indicate that a believer could indeed end up in hell. For example, the parable of the sower we dealt with. Uh, some believe for a while and then fall away and bring no fruit to perfection. Or the children of the kingdom that are cast into outer darkness. We covered those. 
Now the children of the kingdom are Jews, and the parable of the sower is pre-church era, before the Holy Spirit had been poured out in the way he has been in the church age, and thus sealing the Holy Spirit, or the, the believer by the Holy Spirit, for a guaranteed safe delivery home. Today I want to start on problem believers, and you'll note that I've quoted the word believers because not all those who name the name of Christ are indeed believers. There are many people that profess to know him and in works deny him. There are others that are believers indeed, but they still walk in disobedience. And so we want to talk a little bit about that today and then those false teachers that would lead people astray. And so beginning today under the subject of problem believers, we have the word licentiousness. Um, Lasciviousness is also one of the words that is translated depending on your translation, your Bible translation, or lewdness. Uh, These three words are all used interchangeably throughout Scripture. There are some different Greek words Related to lewdness, there are, there are occasions in which lewdness is the correct translation. Uh, and in this context, lewdness, lasciviousness, or licentiousness would be appropriate. And this is found in the book of Jude. We also have a parallel passage that's not cited for you here in Second Peter. And so if you've noted, Second uh, Peter and Jude have a lot of similarity Uh, And it is no doubt that the Holy Spirit was encouraging a exclamation point on the subject. But in this case, from the book of Jude, one chapter, uh, verses 3 through 4, and then a part of verse 12. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness. Now you'll note that I've also added the word lasciviousness or licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. These are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. The word only there is added by the translators. That is not my italics, uh, but it is nonetheless important to the context. And so these guys that... Jude warns about and Peter warns about turn the grace of our God into lewdness or into lasciviousness or licentiousness. In this case, I prefer the term licentiousness, which is, in effect, a license to sin. And so this is one of the things that we deal with here at Candlelight. And over the many years that I've been talking to you about the security of the believer We've had people attend church here that will leave and say, well, Paul just tells people it's okay to sin. It, really, I, you'd be surprised how many times I've heard this. Well, I would like to reemphasize the fact that we do not believe that it's okay to sin. As believers, we are called to live distinct lives. We are to be otherworldly. We're not to carouse as the world does. And so these things are... Important that we should highlight that there are those who do indeed turn the grace of our God into, I'll use the term, licentiousness. And so the point that I make related to sinning is not that if you sin that you will forfeit your salvation, but if you sin intentionally in particular, it harms others. Thus I put as the third note here, Is it love uh, for God or man if we intentionally sin? And the answer, of course, is no. The Bible tells us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And if we sin intentionally, we are harming others. We're harming our testimony, which indeed does, in fact, then harm 
the name of the Lord. The children of Israel were notorious about this, and God continually rebuked them. He disciplined them, and he showed them that I am going to make my name great in all the earth in spite of you. And so in some ways, God disciplined Israel so that he would show that he does not condone their willful disobedience, even though they were indeed his covenant people, and that God will not break his covenant with Israel nationally, he indeed will not break his covenant with the church as a corporate whole. If you are genuinely born again and he has sealed you with the Holy Spirit of promise, you are guaranteed safe passage to heaven in spite of your works. But that does not mean we should sin. It doesn't mean we should disobey. I will admit that for the most part, Churches fall down on the other end of this spectrum. They would, for the most part, encourage you to be legalistic, to be afraid of losing your salvation. A great number of churches today do teach that you can forfeit or lose your salvation and that it is based on your works. And so there is a overbalance, I would suggest, in relationship to obedience and faith. That's hard to say, an overbalance. John MacArthur is noted for this. I know many of you like John MacArthur, and some of you may not like me in a minute. John MacArthur's got a book that he wrote called The Gospel According to Jesus, and in The Gospel According to Jesus, he documents what theologians refer to as lordship salvation. My own youth pastor, and I told you that I was brought up in this environment, used to tell us Jesus is not your savior if he is not your Lord. Meaning that if you are not walking in obedience to him, you're denying him as savior and therefore you are not saved. I know that this is true in even some of our own local ministries friends of mine, pastors that I love and adore, really, who will tell people at times, based on their behavior, if you do these things, you are not saved. Well, the problem with telling somebody that is that you will then never have any security as a believer. In fact, you will have the eternal insecurity of the believer. Because if you are genuinely born again and you misbehave and you're told that you're not saved, how will you ever know indeed that you are saved? Because you are a sinner and you still fall short of the glory of God. Or are the rest of you perfect and I'm the only one that still struggles? You see. And so MacArthur says that if Jesus is not your Lord, he's not your Savior, and that you should be very afraid. Uh, in fact, you are no doubt unsaved if you're walking in disobedience. This is the doctrines of lordship salvation, which come in kind of an odd voice when you're dealing with John MacArthur, who, by the way, is a brilliant man, and I like him. Uh, so if you already are angry with me and that's bothering you that I talk like this, just breathe in and out for a minute. Um, the fact is, I think MacArthur's got a lot of great things to say, and he's especially done a great job during the COVID crisis. He stood up, and he wouldn't close his church, and he's done a fantastic job navigating this, and he's provided strong leadership. He's also a Calvinist, which I think is interesting because if you have ever read John MacArthur, he's very confused about his Calvinism. Um, he is a dispensational Calvinist, by the way. And most Calvinists are amillennial or postmillennial, and they are covenantal. That's what we call Reformed theology. And so MacArthur's his own guy. He's a very different guy. And so he would be the one on the, the one end of the perspective uh, perspective or the spectrum that would say to you, if you are not walking in obedience to the Lord, then you are not saved. I would uh, take that a little differently. I would say if you are not walking properly in the Lord 
and you're advocating for disobedience, that is licentiousness, and you should be very concerned about whether indeed you are saved. And there's a difference. You can be born again and still sin. I think most of you in this room probably know that. But should we? And the answer, of course, is no. And so that end of the spectrum is that if you in any way disobey, even willfully if you disobey, that you are not saved. And I would disagree with that heartily. In fact, in 1 John, there's a passage that is often used that says they went out from us because they were not of us. And if they were of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. And they relate that passage to walking in obedience to the Lord in the details of your life. Because, in the same book, John says, he who sins is of the devil. And the devil has sinned from the beginning. The problem is that the sin that is being referred to in 1 John is the sin of denying that Jesus is Christ, not the sin of messing up or even intentionally caving into temptation. I know, for example, many young people today, and I digress. I am not advocating for this. Listen carefully. But look, many young people, when dating, end up sleeping together. And then they think, well, I've lost my salvation. Well, no, you just need to repent. If you're a Christian and you're living licentiously, you need to repent. And this is the importance of the true side of the doctrines. And so on MacArthur's end, the idea that he might communicate to a believer that if you are living in disobedience, you're not saved, at the other end of the spectrum are those people that say, it doesn't matter what you do, do whatever you want. Uh, in fact, Anton LaVey would like that doctrine. Nobody reacted. No one knows who Anton LaVey is anymore. I'm just old. Anton LaVey is the leader, was the leader. I think he's dead now probably no longer believes the way he used to believe. Um, uh, Anton LaVey was the founder of the first church of Satan in San Francisco, and he wrote this, the Satanic Bible. And I remember watching an interview with Anton LaVey at one point, and he said, uh, someone asked him, what is the cardinal doctrine of Satanism? And he said, do what thou wilt. That was the cardinal doctrine. Do whatever you want. If it feels good, do it. Anybody here remember that expression? Are we all this too young to remember these things? A couple of you. All right, good. All right. Free love and, you know, it's, it's all good, baby. What's happening? Right? Uh, we remember, especially if you're from California like I am. And so you remember these things and we absolutely condemn the idea that a believer should disobey or that a believer uh, should feel comfortable in their sin. We'll be looking at that next week uh, when we talk about the blessed misery. We've talked about it many times. You know what it is. Most of you do, but I'm going to illustrate it a little bit uh, for you next week. And so is it okay to sin? Absolutely not. Do we endorse disobedience? Absolutely not. Is it love if we disobey? Absolutely not. We want to honor the Lord with our lives. But there are certain men who have crept in unnoticed who turn the grace of our God into lewdness or into lasciviousness or licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In this case, the idea of denial is not just simply not believing who Jesus is, but in works, definitively denying him. And so these are people who profess to know the Lord. They are in your love feasts. The love feast is what would be considered communion. Uh, the way we do communion today in the church is very different than the way it was practiced in the early church. And that is why Paul wrote to the Corinthians and told them when you come together to share the common Lord's Supper, some of you get drunk and others of you are gluttonous because it was a feast. 
they would come together. And during that love feast, the time when they would get together and break bread together, they weren't preferring others. They would be selfish. I'm hungrier than you, so I'm going to eat more and I'm going to leave nothing behind. Um, I think I've seen that actually happen at candlelight a few times. Some of you aren't laughing. I'm not looking at you and I have no one in my mind. I just recall at times seeing the heaping plates of food when we would run out or the heaping plates of dessert. I even at one point told the, the, uh, the crew on Wednesday night, I, I said, maybe what we should do is segregate the desserts into separate little plates. You have to take one dessert because I had seen some literally, uh, one, I can't remember, I won't name the person now because now I do remember who it was. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not kidding you. It was a full dinner-sized plate just heaped up with desserts. And uh, the way I look, you'd think I ate that way, but one cookie cures me, and so that's all that there is. Uh, and then today, of course, being Valentine's Day, that's why I'm wearing this shirt, by the way, that Merry Christmas. This is your gift. From My gift to you is this shirt today. Uh, this, but, uh, you know, this is a day when a lot of people eat a lot of sweets, and so be moderate. Indeed. Amen. So we are called to walk in obedience. Romans chapter 13, we'll get there. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness. Uh, that lewdness is a, actually a, a, the correct translation. It's not the same word that is translated lasciviousness. But the, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And so while we believe that a believer who is genuinely born again has no concern for the loss of their salvation, you are guaranteed safe delivery by the power and person of the Holy Spirit. We are called to a life and a walk of obedience. It is time to awake out of sleep. Now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Do you believe that today? Do you think we're closer to the day of the return of the Lord than we've ever been? Well, you might say, well, logically, I mean, that's a no-brainer. But even prophetically, we're living in the days, you guys. And so, therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Oh, that I wish Christians could take heed here more than ever, especially in relationship to strife and envy. We don't see as much the problem of revelry and drunkenness, lewdness and lust in the churches. It's still there. It's, it happens. There are people that drink too much and they get drunk and they just live a party lifestyle and it's unacceptable. Uh, lewdness and lust. Lewdness in this context is actually translated wantonness. You're never satisfied. I call it the spirit of Solomon. You know, he was never satisfied. Uh, I'll, I won't elaborate for time today. But not in lewdness and lust, but in strife and envy. I do still see far too much strife and envy in the church. Oh, that God would give us humility and that we would have a brokenness so that we would do all we can to get along with each other. Amen? Somebody told me or asked me a question years ago. I think I've mentioned it to you before. It was Daryl Kraft. I jumped in his truck one day to go to lunch and he said, Paul, what is the most difficult thing or the least um, favored thing about being a pastor? And I told him, unresolved conflict. I can't tell you how much it breaks my heart when I see believers not getting along. Strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. 
I put the note here again. I put all these little pieces on the screen for your benefit. It also reminds me of things to talk about. The Corinthians and salvation. I mentioned this last week and maybe the week before. The funny thing about the Corinthians is that they were literally the worst Christians in the Bible. Everything you could name about sinning, they were doing. And Paul rebukes them for it and calls them to repentance. But nowhere does he say to them, you're not saved. And I think that's really an important distinction. We need to know that even though we are believers and we have a guarantee of salvation, we are called to a life of obedience. Secondly, and I want to bring this up just briefly, um, false prophets and false teachers. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. This licentiousness would be one of them. Even denying the Lord who bought them. By the way, if you are a Calvinist and you believe in limited atonement, meaning that Jesus only died for the elect and only died for those that he would save, then I would challenge you, to think about this verse, even denying the Lord who bought them. And they bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. The way some people live causes the way of truth to be blasphemed. And by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. The thing that's interesting to me here is that Peter says, and we'll cite from Paul as well, that the false teachers would be among them, even as those guys who promoted lewdness or lasciviousness, licentiousness, were spots in your love feasts, He says here that they will be among you. And then I asked the question, should we mark them and should we call them out? And this is a really big question for our day. Continuing, and then I'll come back to that, on the wolves, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. This is, of course, Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves." And so, in comment, these wolves attempt to separate sheep from the shepherd, drawing them to themselves. And watch out for the self-proclaiming versus the Christ exalting. And so, in the same context of calling out the false teachers, the false prophet, and the wolves, Paul makes it very clear that he is warning the church that in these days, the days in which we live, There would be false teachers, there would be false prophets, and there will be wolves that will be among you. That's the part that's interesting to me, among you. And the question, of course, is are we allowed to call them out? Are we allowed to mark them? The Bible is very clear about this. We are to mark them. Now, I urge you, brethren, from Romans chapter 16, note... Now, I added mark or scope out because that is a correct, uh, probably extended translation of the word note. I urge you, brethren, mark those or note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has been 
become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so while he's encouraging the believer, these in Rome, and we'll get there in our study in the next year. It's only a couple chapters away, but we'll get there. He tells them, mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that you've learned and avoid them. Well, if we cannot warn others about them, why the call to note them? <laughs> That's a big problem. <laughs> See, today, if you mark a false teacher, if you mark a false prophet, if you mark a wolf, you're called the divisive one. You'll be the one that is accused of selfish ambition and envy and strife. We need to be very careful about the way we rightly divide the word of truth in this context. A wolf separates the sheep from the shepherd. He tries to get them to isolate and to think independently of the whole of the church under the leadership of the elders that God has placed in their lives. Now, I realize that this is a, a broad spectrum as well. You've got the polar opposites of abuse, uh, leadership abuse, and then those that have absolutely no concern for the institutional church. Did you know that God is the one that designed the institutional church? And if you can define institution, which means that there are standards and rules and regulations and levels of obedience and submission then you would have to understand if God is a God of order and does all things decently and in order, that God has indeed called men and women who are born again to be a part of an institution called the church. And we're not talking about a corporation. We're not talking about legal entities. We're talking about the fact that in a church, there is leadership. In a church, there are elders, there are deacons, there is accountability. There is a requirement of walking in obedience and participation. I mentioned before that 25% of the professing church today, and they may very well be born again, will not attend a local church. I'm only bringing this up now because I know that there are many people that now that COVID is beginning to take a break, as it were, who knows what's next, I know that there's all kinds of discussion we could have about this, that it is time for people to start coming back to church. There are still people that are staying home. There are still people that are not engaging in the fellowship of the body of Christ. And the Bible tells us in the last days in which we are living, not to forsake the assembling together of ourselves as the manner of some is. And I'm preaching to you guys in the choir, but I'm also preaching to you that are not just in the choir today. Because many of you are watching online. Some of you are listening on the radio right now. And I am not condemning anyone that is staying home, being safe, being careful. But very soon you need to start planning to come back to church. It's one of the reasons we're going to a third service. Because we realize that we're going to need to, if the people that are part of Candlelight come back, that haven't been here, with the growth that we've experienced, we will not have enough room. And I want people to come back and be a part of the local church. My phone's starting to blow up in my pocket. I know people are like, oh, it's, I can feel it. It's, it's on vibrate. It's, I'm not going to look. God bless you out there. There's also the other end of the spectrum where you have pastoral abuse and, abuse and the shepherding movement and control, and that is dangerous as well. But I want you to be aware of the fact that if you have a shepherd, and in your case you do, who is willing to tell you the truth and sometimes even at the risk of being liked, and you think I don't like to be liked, I do. Do you think I don't have a, a self-esteem of my own? Do you think that I don't have my own personal pride? I do. I want to be liked. I've had many people, though, come and tell me, Paul, you're one of the most courageous men I've ever seen. I'm so thankful that you're willing to take a stand and that you're fearless. And I tell them when that happens, I said, don't, don't misunderstand. I'm actually more afraid than you think. The truth is I just fear God more than I fear men. 
And so I must tell the truth. And if the Bible says mark those that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines that you've learned and avoid them, then it's my job as a shepherd to direct you into knowing who they are. And yet today we're not allowed to call out those that are false teachers because that is politically incorrect and unloving, quote unquote, which is not true. When you have guys like Joel Osteen out there, they do not preach the true gospel. When there are, there are men out there that are promoting licentiousness, and I'm not certain about Joel Osteen and his lifestyle, but I will tell you that when he's asked if Jesus is the only way, he says, I don't know. I mark him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Number four, and this is my last point, enemies of the cross. Brethren, join in following my example. This is an interesting expression coming from Paul the Apostle. He's, he's really taking a, a, a very lofty place to say, follow my lead. Do what I do. Imitate my life and you'll be pleasing to the Lord. I wish that I could tell you that was how I felt about my walk. I am still growing and still falling short. And so I'll just point you to Paul. Follow his example, not mine. I do intend to live righteously and godly in the present age, though. I think those of you that know me know that. But join in following my example and note those, mark those, who so walk... And as you have us for a pattern or an example. For many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, in this context, we're not dealing per se with the professing believer or even the possessing believer, but those that intentionally are among you that would lead people astray, wolves and false teachers. We don't mark wolves anymore. It's, we're too likely to get sued. Well, I'd rather tell the truth and get sued than play the hypocrite and conceal the truth. Amen? And in the context of those that would promote licentious behavior, their walk, it, they become enemies of the cross of Christ. I'm a Christian and we do whatever we want and we steal and we lie and we're mean. We're sleeping around, drunk, you name it, go through the list. It doesn't speak well to our reverence for God and point people to Jesus as Savior if we are not living a life of obedience. And so while I do now, and mentioned earlier a few weeks ago that I was raised in a church that I was scared to death that I was going to lose my salvation. And now I've read my Bible and I've studied and I know that if you're born again, you can be absolutely secure in your faith. I also am aware of the fact that we as believers must live a life of obedience because we honor the Lord. We love the Lord. I'll close with this quick comment. Years ago, I, my wife challenged me. I, I've been studying the words of the cross and all the things that the Lord had been communicating to me through the, the words of the cross. And I mentioned to you last Sunday that it was during that study of who Jesus really was and the sacrifice that he made for me that um, it was during that process and during that period of time that I really fell in love with the Lord because I didn't really know how to love somebody I didn't know. And as I got to know the Lord, I fell more in love with the Lord. And I remember reading the words from the cross, I thirst. And I wept. Because I realized Jesus is not just God incarnate, but he is a man feeling the cross and all the pain and rejection and the, the, even the, what you might consider the minor 
inconvenience of thirst in relationship to the major pain of the flagra and the crown of thorns and the convulsions of his body and the nails through his hand and the spike through his feet and his body openly wounded so that blood was gushing forth from every part of his body and where his visage was marred more than any man. And he said, I thirst. And I wept. And I said, Lord, I will give you a drink with my life. And it was a couple of years later, Brenda said to me one day, I don't know what I was doing, but I must have been misbehaving. I'm sure it wasn't. She said, you don't have to bow your head. I still like you. <laughs> and I know it wasn't something intentional because I've, since I've married my wife, I have never intentionally lived out in sin. And I'm thankful that I can say that. But whatever it was, it must have been I was having a bad attitude or something. And she said, how's that drink? And I knew what she meant. With my life, I want to give you a drink. Was it pure water? Was it clean water? Was it refreshing water? Or was I offering him the filthy water of my life? My own personal life and behavior. And I just encourage you today, you guys. If you name the name of Christ, live a life of obedience. We do believe in the eternal security of the genuinely born again, but I do not in any way advocate for living a life of sin. Here's this thought. I wrote this quote years ago, and I think I'm going to share it again next week. I'm far more motivated to live righteously by considering that my sins have added to the afflictions of Christ my Lord than by the fear of future suffering some have suggested will be the resulting consequences experienced at the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus paid it all, all to him. I owe. I'm not motivated to live righteously anymore because I'm afraid of losing my salvation. I'm motivated because of the sacrifice of my Lord. I'm far more motivated to live righteously knowing that my sin added to the afflictions of Christ. It was your sin and mine that he took. He bought us with a price and it was his precious blood and I guarantee you he will receive his inheritance. And guess what his inheritance is? Maybe I should say it differently. Guess who you are. Let's stand together. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, for your truth. Lord, I do pray today that we will enjoy so deeply the salvation that we are guaranteed because of your work and, Lord, that we would live a life of obedience as an offering, a free will offering of ourselves unto you. We present ourselves unto you. Use us for your glory, we pray, as you send us forth today in your grace and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. See you guys on Wednesday.